Everyone's got a favorite movie. It's just a matter of personal taste, and nobody's wrong about which movie is their favorite, but there's a big difference between favorite and greatest, and sooner or later, whether you're hanging out with a group of friends, or you're standing in line somewhere, or you've just gotten out of a movie and you're all having a good time, someone's gonna ask, what's the greatest movie of all time? There are a lot of acceptable answers. The Godfather, Jaws, Seven Samurai, Star Wars, Super Mario Brothers, The Matrix, 2001, but there's one answer that always seems to divide the room. Citizen Kane. Most of your friends probably haven't even seen it, but someone in the group is going to have to point out how boring and overrated it is. If Citizen Kane bores you, that's fine. Great storytelling isn't enough for some people, but if you think it's overrated... You may think that, but you're wrong. It is just one of the great movies ever made. It inspired a generation of filmmakers to continue pushing the boundaries of what cinema could be, and we've seen movie after movie donate scenes to pay tribute to it. Sometimes the references are pretty obvious, but every movie since its release is stolen from Citizen Kane. If you watch it now for the first time, you might not understand why it was so revolutionary, but that's only because the things that make it revolutionary have been copied so many times that you've seen it all before without even realizing. Which understandably leaves a lot of people wondering... <laughs> Orson Welles first got national recognition at the age of 24 with his radio rendition of H.G. Wells' sci-fi classic, The War of the Worlds. Wait a minute, something's happening. A humped shape is rising out of the pit. I can make out a small beam of light against a mirror. Logs are turning into flames. Ah! Oh, the whole field's caught up by the woods. The fires are... The gas tanks, tanks for the automobiles are spreading everywhere. Coming this way now, about 20 yards to my right. It thoroughly freaked out a lot of people who thought the breaking news stories they were hearing were real. Newspapers ran national headlines like, Radio listeners in panic, taking war drama as fact. And, Radio fake, scares the nation. Papers claimed reports of suicides, heart attacks, and police stations being overwhelmed by hundreds of calls. Wells explained that fake news reports during radio dramas were nothing new, and he never intended to cause a panic. The day after the broadcast, Wells was mobbed by reporters, asking for an explanation for why he played such a cruel joke on his fellow Americans. I am terribly shocked by the effect it's had. I do not believe that the method is original with me or, or peculiar to the Mercury Theater's presentation. Despite the controversy, the headlines won the interest of one of the biggest Hollywood studios of the Golden Age, RKO Pictures. RKO studio head George S. Schaefer had been impressed by Wells' work at the Mercury Theater, and the sensational War of the Worlds broadcast was enough to convince him that Wells had a place in Hollywood. Wells refused the first several contracts he was given, but eventually Schaefer made him an offer he couldn't refuse. The contract Wells eventually accepted was one that gave him final cut on the first two films he made with RKO, as well as the opportunity to write, produce, direct, and star with total creative control. I got that good a contract because I didn't really want to make a film. The contract allowed him to choose his own cast and crew, and because Wells had taken on some debts with the Mercury Theater, he accepted the contract and brought most of his team to Hollywood with him. The first movie he tried to make there was an adaptation of Joseph Conrad's novella, Heart of Darkness. Despite the power his contract gave him, his idea to shoot an entire movie in first person was too bizarre and RKO refused to produce it. Instead, they asked him to direct a sensational sci-fi movie called The Men From Mars, so they could capitalize on his War of the Worlds hype. Wells said he'd consider the project, but wanted to work on something else first. What RKO didn't know was that he'd already begun filming Citizen Kane. This method of getting a movie made is another example of Kane's legacy, and it was adopted by some of the greats in the decades that followed. We were just running too fast for anyone to stop us. Yeah. We never got permission uh, to start on the, those movies. We just sort of started, and by the time uh, they realized what we were doing, uh, we were already had those films in production. First and foremost, the thing that Kane gets praised for is its cinematography. And I began noticing camera movement because he used that wide-angle lens a great deal. The visual language of film speaks to you subconsciously all the time, and so much of that vocabulary was created with Citizen Kane. Wells had honed his craft on stage, but didn't have any behind-the-camera experience when he was offered his first movie deal. Fortunately, the legendary cinematographer Greg Toland was available. Toland had seen a few plays at the Mercury Theater, which Wells owned and operated, and was so impressed that he got in contact with Wells as soon as he arrived in Hollywood. I had in my first picture in Kane the greatest cameraman who ever lived, who was Greg Toland. And he came to my office and said, I want to work in your picture. My name is Toland. And I said, why do you, Mr. Toland? He said, because you've never made a picture. <laughs> Tolan wanted to work with a visionary that hadn't been taught the limits of what a camera could do, and in Orson Welles, he found exactly that. Together, they pioneered and mastered several filmic techniques. One of the most obvious is their use of deep focus shots. Welles had Tolan design a new camera lens that would allow for subjects extremely far away to stay in focus. This meant that Welles could use the entire depth of field within the frame as a method of storytelling. We see the technique used throughout the entire movie, and it's especially noticeable at the end, when Kane's marriage is falling apart. 
The depth of field Tolan's new lenses could capture made it look like Kane and Susan were miles away from each other for their final few conversations. Without dialogue or even stage direction, shots like this show us exactly how much figurative distance is between them. The most impressive use of deep focus comes from this scene, in which Charlie Kane's mom signs the papers to send him away to go inherit $60 million. Instead of cutting to Mrs. Kane deliberating, then to Mr. Thatcher scheming, Mr. Kane protesting, back to Mrs. Kane making her decision, and then over to the victim of the scene, the way any other director would have done at the time, Wells and Tolan give us everything we need to know in a single shot. What we're looking at here is a great example of mise-en-scene, or the story within the frame. Mrs. Kane has all the power on the scene, so the camera follows her and the other characters have to follow. When Mrs. Kane sits down, Wells has blocked the characters from most to least powerful. Mrs. Kane is in the foreground, and her stoic face holds our attention throughout the scene. A bit deeper into the frame is Mr. Thatcher, who doesn't really have any power except what Mrs. Kane gives him. A bit further back is Mr. Kane, who's been shoved off to the left side of the screen and totally ignored. And way back there in the background, thanks to Tolan's depth of focus, we can see little Charlie Kane, oblivious and fighting an imaginary war. The adults in the room are having a conversation that essentially amounts to the sale of Charlie Kane, and thanks to Wells' framing, we can see him packed up neatly in a little box. Of course, this sort of visual storytelling is everywhere in movies now. We're in a generation that's grown up watching movies made by people inspired by Stanley Kubrick, Steven Spielberg, and Francis Coppola, but none of those filmmakers would have achieved what they did if shots like this in Citizen Kane didn't show them how. Like, like and, and subscribe. subscribe. Beyond just deep focus shots, the movie is littered with examples of the camera providing a narrative. We're looking up at Kane because he's in power in this scene, we're looking down at Susan because she's weak in this scene, and we can feel how overwhelmed Susan is in this scene thanks to some overcranking of the camera. Occasionally it seemed like Wells and Toland were just showing off. Look at Susan's introduction to the movie. This shot goes over a sign, through a skylight, and down into an over-the-shoulder shot, which later transitions into another great use of deep focus that emphasizes the scene's character dynamic. Pulling off a shot with multiple transitions this smoothly even today would be impressive, but these geniuses did it in 1941. Before Citizen Kane, lighting in Hollywood was just a technical necessity, but Wells was clearly inspired by the works of some pioneering German expressionists. The lighting in Citizen Kane is just another of many examples of visual storytelling in the movie. The most powerful men in the world, the ones who decide what to tell people to believe, don't have faces. Interpret that how you will. It was the Illuminati. Though not nearly as influential as the groundbreaking cinematography in Kane, the script is a true work of art that's just as relevant today as it was in the 40s. Wells contracted the well-known screenwriter Herman Mankiewicz to develop an idea about the downfall of a powerful media mogul. After agreeing on characters and a rough outline for the story, Mankiewicz spent 10 weeks typing up what would become a 266-page first draft that was then called simply American. Wells condensed the draft considerably, rearranging and adding his own scenes as he saw fit. Citizen Kane is a modern American story about a man called Kane. Charles Foster Kane. The story starts with a brief scene of Kane as a child, being sent away from the boarding house where he lived in order to accept a large inheritance. When Kane grows up and finds out one of the things he's inherited is a failing newspaper company, the first thing he does is use it to torment Thatcher, the man who he sees is responsible for tearing him away from his carefree life. As the paper becomes more successful and Kane buys out the competition, he realizes how easily he can use headlines to sway the public's opinion. So, naturally, he runs for office. Just when it was looking like he was going to win the election, someone outs him for having an affair, and his whole political career comes crashing down. He fights to keep the love of his followers by making some pretty outlandish claims, but nobody buys it, so he marries his mistress and goes home to Xanadu to become a recluse. Wow! What a mansion! Throughout the course of their marriage, Kane shamelessly promotes Susan as an opera singer, which is something she never really wanted and isn't particularly good at. I'm through! I never wanted to in the first place! Eventually, she gets tired of him trying to use her to inflate himself, and she leaves him like everybody else did. Kane throws his famous tantrum and lives the rest of his short life alone. On his deathbed, in his palace of self-imposed isolation, he remembers the innocence of childhood, back before he'd started exploiting the people who cared about him. Before he tried to use his wealth to earn people's love, he remembers the simple joy of riding a sled. And then, he dies. Ultimately, the character of Kane is a tragic one. An old man dies alone, overcome by his wealth, and robbed of his innocence. It's said that in your dying moments, your life will flash before your eyes, and in the case of Kane, all that came to mind was the simple joy of riding his childhood sled. People are speculating Rosebud is W.R.'s pet name for Marion's genitalia. Charles Foster Kane was actually such a sympathetic character that the film was banned in Russia, where they thought audiences relating to a capitalist millionaire would be a threat to communist rule. Ironically, in the States, the movie was bashed by some critics for being fascist propaganda. The decent, ordinary citizens know that I'll do everything in my power to protect the underprivileged, the underpaid, and the underfed!
These days, we think of Tarantino's editor Sally Menke as responsible for pioneering a chronological storytelling, but nope, that was Kane too. Remember at the beginning of the video when we said the War of the Worlds broadcast caused mass hysteria? That never happened. The Mercury Theater radio program had only been on air for a few months, the show barely had a budget, and a C.E. Hooper rating service reported in a 5,000 listener survey the night of the broadcast that 98% of listeners were tuned in to something else. Those who did hear it looked at it as a prank and accepted it that way. Don't believe everything you hear on the radio. The newspaper industry had been losing the battle against radio for over a decade, and sensationalizing the fake news broadcasts that were in the world of the world seemed like too easy of a target to ignore. By presenting radio programs as an immature and dangerous threat to listeners, they'd hoped to demonize the radio and gain back their readership. But all they succeeded in doing was providing an incredible amount of free publicity for Orson Welles. There are many messages in Citizen Kane, but the hysteria manufactured by the newspapers highlights one of the most prominent. He who controls the media controls the nation. Kane uses his newspaper to ruin Thatcher's reputation, and soon after he started making false claims to rile up the public's fear of an attack from Spain. God, you know perfectly well there's not the slightest proof that this... Can you prove it isn't? Using nothing but headlines, Kane was ruining powerful people and starting wars. He was controlling the gullible public by drowning them in 24-7 false information. The news goes on for 24 hours a day. It was an important if the information was true or not because Kane made it entertaining. If the headline is big enough, it makes the news big enough. <laughs> Lines like this made it clear that Citizen Kane was a condemnation of real-life media moguls like William Randolph Hearst. So to look at Citizen Kane, it was a real interesting statement about the power of the press, the power of the media, you know, how one man could mold you know, you want a war, we'll start it for you, you know, that kind of attitude. Hearst and Kane share a lot of similarities. Like Kane, Hearst was an incredibly wealthy newspaper tycoon who ran for governor, had a highly publicized affair with an actress at the end of his political career, and used his paper to influence the American opinion of a war. They both also spent all their newspaper money making giant castles for themselves. Because Herman Mankiewicz knew Hearst personally, he was able to offer Wells an insight into the kind of life a media lord like Hearst would live. Even though Mankiewicz was hired as a consultant and a script doctor, the more the story developed, the more he wanted credit. This is the best thing I've ever written. A debate about who deserves credit for the script has gone on for decades, with reports on both sides with varying degrees of bias. Who wrote exactly what percentage of the script is irrelevant, as Wells has pointed out rather simply. After Mank made a series of unfounded threats, RKO caved and gave him a co-writer credit for the movie. A lot of RKO executives didn't like the controversy Wells brought to the studio, or the power his contract gave him. They were on the brink of financial ruin, and upon learning how damning the script was to the social elite, they offered to reimburse the entire budget of the film if Wells would just destroy it. Wells figured this would happen, however, so he promoted the hell out of the movie to newspapers before its release, which meant that RKO would look terrible if they chose not to release it. Citizen Kane is the title, and we hope it can correctly be called a coming attraction. It's certainly coming, coming to this theater. With their hands tied, RKO executives did whatever they could to stop the movie from being made. One of their tactics was to release the script to the press, which is how it landed in the hands of Hearst. Hearst saw the movie as slander against him and his wife, and banned promotion of the film in any of the newspapers he owned, and threatened the owners of all the papers he didn't. He went so far as to get the premiere of the film cancelled, and the release was delayed for several months. Hearst told owners of the largest theater chains if they played Citizen Kane in any of their theaters, he'd stop running ads for their movies in his paper forever. Eventually, Wells threatened to sue RKO if they didn't release the movie, which led to a much smaller premiere than planned at the RKO Palace Theater on May 1st, 1941. Fortunately, the movie was extremely well received by critics at the few theaters that did show it, and it wound up getting nominated for nine Academy Awards, including Best Screenplay, which it won. I am very happy to accept this award in the manner in which the screenplay was written, which is to say, in the absence of Orson Welles. The answer to why it didn't win every award is lost somewhere in the controversy surrounding its release, but no film could have been more deserving. All of cinema owes a great debt to Citizen Kane for everything from its innovations in cinematography, editing, lighting, and storytelling. At the time of its release, film editing was still in its infancy, sound and films had only been around for about a decade. Wait a minute, wait a minute, you ain't heard nothing yet and filmmakers were just starting to figure out how to move a camera. But it was Orson Welles who showed them how to put it all together. We joined the world of cinema art because of people like Orson Welles. If not for the innovations in Citizen Kane, 20th century filmmakers would have been so robbed of tools from their toolkit that Kubrick wouldn't have been Kubrick, Spielberg wouldn't have been Spielberg, and Scorsese wouldn't have been Scorsese. When a new movie comes out and seems to take the world by storm for whatever reason, it's easy to forget that no matter how unique the new sensation seems to be, it's just a copy of a copy of a copy of the greatest movie ever made. But I, I, I rented those for Peter. He got banned from the video store for taping over their movies. Rosebud.
is his sled. It was his sled from when he was a kid. There, I just saved you two long boobless hours.